Bonjour, hello, and welcome, bienvenue, to City Breaks. This is City Breaks Bordeaux, episode 3. I'm Marion Jones. This third episode on Bordeaux is an episode in two halves, focusing on two different eras, which were, in their different ways, very exciting for the development of the city, namely the Roman period and the medieval period. I'm going to be focusing on places in the city you can visit today to find out more about both of them and telling some stories along the way, so that if you do go and visit them, you have an understanding of what you're looking at. Right then, the Romans in Bordeaux, or Bordiglia as they called it. By the 3rd century, Bordiglia was a thriving city of about 20,000 people. The most important Roman city in the area, often referred to at the time as Petit Rome, the Little Rome. The north-south axis of the city was roughly where the Rue Sainte Catherine is today. There was a protective wall built all around it, with towers that were so high that the poet Asonius described them as being, quote, so tall that their summits pierce the clouds. Mostly gone, of course, sadly, but there are little pockets where you can find out more, particularly the ruins of the amphitheatre, known as the Palais Gallien. Also, there are clues in some of the street names. If you find, for example, the Rue des Piliers de Tutelle, that's named after the Tutelle, which was a large Roman temple overlooking the river. And there's an area northeast of the city centre, called today the Terre Negre, which was very much outside the Roman city, because that's where they built their cemetery, feeling very much that the dead and the living should be kept apart. This area was excavated in the 19th century, leading to lots more knowledge about the Romans. But really, really, if there's one place to start, if you want to find out about Roman Bordeaux, Bordiglia, I think it's the wonderful Musée d'Aquitaine, on the Cour Pasteur in the city centre. The main opening rooms are devoted to the history of the Romans in Bordeaux. There's lots to see and lots to learn. For example, the idea that the city was built, you've guessed it, around a forum. Archaeologists are not still quite sure exactly where that was. They know too that there was the large temple, the Pilier de Tutelle. There's evidence that there were aqueducts and a pipe system running right through the city, providing water and allowing the lovely fountains that were dotted about to run. One of those clever systems the Romans were so good at, and all paid for by the man who was perhaps the best-known ruler of Bordeaux, best-known Roman ruler, one Caius Julius Secundus, who was there between about 30 and 50 AD. It was a beautiful city, very decorated. Think altars, statues of emperors, for example, the Emperor Claudius. To quote the museum website, the town was adorned with exceptionally rich, often ostentatious ornamental decoration, which we can see in the famous temple of the Pilier de Tutelle, known from engravings and monumental architectural fragments, or the vast mosaic from a house in the town centre. And yes, that mosaic is very striking. I've got some lovely photos of it, which I'll put on the website. So, Bordiglia was beautiful. It was also cosmopolitan, a very much a trading city. And we know that because of many of the gravestones which were found, on which there were often foreign names. Some were of people from other Roman cities, but there were many other examples too. Breton sailors, cloth merchants from Northern Europe, traders from the East. It was a real melting pot. The Romans settled in Bordeaux for all the obvious reasons, the climate, the beauty of the surrounding countryside, and particularly because it was such a good place from which to do trade. Again, here's the museum website. Quote, the wealth of a town located at a crossroads of maritime, river and land-based corridors, which led the population to engage in trade. Bordiglia became the focal point for exchanges distributing the goods from the town's hinterland to the rest of the empire. We know there was plenty of money in Roman Bordeaux. Thousands of Roman coins have been found in the River Garonne. Some of those can be seen in the museum, as can lots and lots of other things. Objects from daily life, so tableware, tools, statues indicating the trades that people did, stonemasons with their tools, for example, carpenters, and lots and lots of artefacts indicating the wine trade. It was the Romans who first brought vines to the area, bringing them from their other territories, for example, along the Adriatic coastline. This was in the first century. And, as we all know today, it took off. By 40 AD, Bordeaux wine had acquired a reputation 
as being one of the top three wines exported to Rome from anywhere in the empire. There's lots of material too showing how people lived, evidence of the homes of the well-off, villas, some of them in the countryside, some of them surrounding the harbour, and you can see that they had mosaic covered floors, heated walls, beautiful inner courtyards with fountains and porticos, colonnaded galleries. The homes of poorer citizens were much less durable, no trace of them, but presumably they were made of earthen walls with thatched roofs. We've heard already what the Romans were drinking, high quality wine, and as for food, of course they were eating all the things that can be grown in the rich agricultural land around the city, but I did also discover some interesting little snippets. For example, the fact that Roman hosts who wanted to impress their guests would serve their very best wine, along with snacks of midoc oysters, pink flamingo meat, and the meat of nightingales flavoured with rose petals. You may be thinking this all sounds very idyllic, and in lots of ways I think it probably was, but life expectancy was short. There are lots of children's graves evidenced in the museum. For example, the gravestone of Lytus's daughter, a little girl of about five or six, who's shown holding a puppy and wearing bracelets and earrings, probably gold or silver. Religion was important. The Roman religion, of course, was the official one. There's evidence that sacrifices were made in the Forum. You can see a bronze statue of the god Hercules, shown holding a lion's paw, a reference to the story of his twelve labours, the first of which was to slay a lion. But there's also evidence that the Romans allowed local religions, so the worship of someone like Sirona, the goddess of spring, and also because of the eastern influence from visiting traders, there were other gods too. For example, there's a statue of the god Mithra, the sun god, as explained on the website. Quote, the most recent archaeological excavations have uncovered one of the largest known Gallic Mithraea, a temple dedicated to the mystery cult of the god Mithra. So all in all, you can learn at the Musée d'Aquitaine that Bordiglia was a thriving civilization, And perhaps you are wondering what happened to end it. Well, that too is explained. The empire got so vast that it became difficult to govern and became prone too to uprisings and raids from other tribes, some of whom are rather wonderfully described as the Barbar du Nord, so barbarians from the north. Some Roman citizens began to make the journey back to Rome and eventually the city of Bordiglia was torched to the ground. Early Christian buildings were put up in the second half of the 4th century and by the 5th century the Germanic tribes had arrived and the Roman past was a distant memory. Apart from the Musée d'Aquitaine, there's one other place I'd definitely recommend visiting if you're interested in the city's Roman past and that is the Palais Gallien which you will find on a map near the Jardin Public, near the saint Cernan Church. And I found somewhere this helpful description. If you stand on the crossroads of the Rue Sansa and the Rue du Colisée, which of course means Colosseum Road, then you are in the middle of the amphitheatre. You will need to take your imagination with you, because only bits of it remain. Parts of the original North Gate and a few of the archways which supported the stands. But... Archaeologists can tell us quite a lot about what was originally there, so imagine an oval-shaped terrain about 130 metres at its longest end and perhaps 110 at its widest point. Imagine a facade made of seven layers of alternating brick and stone, so a sort of stripy effect, wooden stairways leading up to tiered wooden seating. If you've been to other Roman amphitheatres in southern France, for example the one at Arles, which is of a similar date, a lot more stone there. It was a feature of the Bodiglia Amphitheatre that there was a lot of wood used. It had a capacity of 22,000 people, so try and picture them sitting excitedly in the stands, watching the games, watching the gladiator tournaments. Highlights in the year of the Romans who lived here in Bodiglia for several centuries. Turning then to part two of the episode, Medieval Bordeaux, here too the Musée d'Aquitaine has much to tell us, explained on their website. Quote, the exhibitions examine such themes as Eleanor of Aquitaine, the pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela, medieval expansion under the English kings, Gascon feudalism and knighthood, wine cultivation, 
commercial exchanges with England, the Black Prince, Troubadours. So you can hear from that that this was a truly exciting period in the history of the city. I'm going to be talking mainly about the English era, as we might call it, so from the 12th to the 15th century, defined as beginning when Eleanor of Aquitaine married the Plantagenet, Henry, who was very soon to become Henry II of England, so uniting England and Aquitaine and putting them all under the same rule, and ending in 1453 when the area was finally annexed back to France. It was a very prosperous period, thanks, at least in part, to King Henry, who decided that there would be tax-free status for trade with England. This meant the absolute flourishing of trade between Bordeaux and England, particularly for wine, but also for products like cloth and wheat. So that in turn led to the growth of the city and to the fact that there was lots of money for buildings. Some of the city's loveliest towers and churches date from this period. There are areas of the city today where you can see the influence of this period, and one of the key ones is the area around Saint-Pierre, so St. Peter's Church, close to the river and just south of the Place de la Bourse, where Saint-Pierre was built in the 14th and 15th centuries, and which was a thriving port area. Even today, if you just look at the street names around there, you get a picture of the sort of people who lived in Bordeaux, and the trades that they were engaged in. Rue des Argentiers, for example, is where the gold and silversmiths were based. Rue des Bautiers is where the chessmakers worked, making those huge wooden chests for storage and to send goods abroad. The original grain warehouses, very important, were centred around Rue du Chais des Farines, Farine means flour, and the name of Rue des Trois Chandeliers tells us that this is where the chandlers, or candle makers, plied their trade. And just a little further down the river is another important church, Saint-Michel, the centre of a former trading area where Boats landed and were loaded and unloaded, where carpenters had their workshops, there were coopers and blacksmiths, and warehouses for storing salt, used for conserving fish and meat. We know it was a very lively area, as ports usually are, and here, to prove that, a quotation from the church's guidebook. Craftsmen, seamen from around the world, porters, passers-by and the bourgeois mingled and bargained. Beggars and merchants harassed all that came with their colourful and vulgar language. There was singing, card games and drinking in the numerous cabarets that served the drinks of the day. I think it's true to say that the Saint-Michel Cartier is still one of the livelier areas of the city. It's still a place of trade. There's a market under the church spire, I think it's twice a week, Mondays and Saturdays, and a generally thriving atmosphere. Those two districts then were largely working class, and for evidence of the elite of the society, back to the Musée d'Aquitaine, where there's lots of information on knights. The elite warriors, who had their own coat of arms, who owned fiefdoms which gave them plenty of money to spend on weapons and horses, who underwent a dubbing ceremony, during which they paid homage to their lord, and took an oath of loyalty, agreeing to give him forty days a year for military and other service. There are in existence many glazed pottery pictures from the time showing many aspects of medieval life from knights and royalty to religious themes and there's a frieze of photographs of many of them in the museum. I've got some lovely pictures of that and I'll put those on the website. Religion then, also a big theme and in the museum too you'll see lots of bits and pieces from churches, altars and fonts and the most fantastic complete rose window from the 14th century, the sort of thing you normally gaze up at from the ground, but which, when you see it up close on display, you can really appreciate for its size and the beauty of its carving. And here's a sentence from the museum's guidebook reminding us of what an important role religion played in the life of the times. Quote, Recurrent themes in the artworks include angels, saints and martyrs fighting demons, chimera, gargoyles, and also a reminder that the idea of purgatory dates from this period. Quote, to give hope to those who had sinned, the notion of purgatory, midway between heaven and hell, was devised in the 12th century. When you are out and about in central Bordeaux, there are a number of buildings you can visit to see evidence of the medieval period. Sadly, 
The fanciest palace from the time is no more. The Palais d'Ombrière, which you will definitely come across if you read, for example, biographies of Eleanor of Aquitaine. All gone. But there are the two towers which I referred to in the last episode, the Corse Cloche and the Porte de Caillou. And just to add a little to what I said about the Corse Cloche, which was built in the 13th century, it's primarily a reminder of the need for defence for the city, capped with battlements, and facing the river ready to take on anyone who tried to attack the city. And on the bell is a Latin inscription, which gives quite a picture of life at the time too. I ring the hours and my voice is a call to arms. So it was the timekeeper of the city in the days when no one had a watch or a clock, and it was a way of getting out messages quickly. If defenders were needed, they could be summoned by the ringing of the bell. The inscription continues, I sing for happy events and weep for the dead. So you can imagine the bells ringing out for services and celebrations and weddings, and of course, for funerals. The bell does still ring, but only six times a year, so quite symbolic these days. But if you do happen to hear it, it will surely remind you of medieval days in Bordeaux, when it would have been a constant feature of daily life. Another place to visit is saint Seurin Church, Bordeaux's oldest Christian sanctuary. The church that stands there today was begun in the 11th century, so that would include the porch, the crypt and the base of the bell tower. But even then, it was a site with centuries of history. Excavations done in the 19th century revealed 400 ancient graves, some of them dating from Roman times and some from Charlemagne's era. He fought battles nearby and the knights who died were buried here. There's also a legend from the 8th century telling, purportedly, of the time when Charlemagne actually came to visit. The story is told in a work of literature called the Chanson de Roland, Roland's son. Roland was his nephew, a very brave knight who had been killed in the Battle of Roncevaux, fought nearby. It is said that his job was to blow the horn to warn others of danger, and this he did so hard that his temples burst open and he died. His distraught uncle, the Emperor Charlemagne, brought the horn to Bordeaux and left it here in the church. He had even filled it with gold coins as part of his offering. I don't think anyone's sure quite how much of that is true, but what certainly is true is that the church was rebuilt in the 12th century, there were later additions too, and that it was at this point that it was really put on the map, so to speak, because it became a staging point, a stopping place, on the pilgrimage route to Santiago de Compostela. Pilgrims stopped here because they knew that there were relics, some pilgrims brought their own relics, and so the collection grew as did the reputation of the church. Still today you can see evidence of Bordeaux's importance on this pilgrim's route, because set into the pavements at various points in the city are the bronze scallop shells, the scallop shell being the symbol of St James, which mark important places on the route. As time passed, two other Bordeaux churches also became important stopping points on the pilgrim's route. The first was Saint-André, the magnificent new Gothic building, dating from the 12th and 13th centuries, which had such historical significance, having been the site, for example, of the royal wedding between Eleanor of Aquitaine and Louis, very soon to be Louis VII, King of France. And then later again, Saint-Michel was added as a third stop. And if it is a topic which particularly interests you, then I would say that Saint-Michel is definitely worth a visit, because there you will find, on the right-hand side, the St. James's Chapel, which is dedicated to remembering the church's role in the pilgrim's route. Inside you will find a painting of St. James's journey, a statue from the 15th century of St. James, actually that's a reproduction because the original is in the Musée d'Aquitaine, and possibly my favourite, a beautiful stained glass window display recounting the story of St. James, which was actually installed later than you might think in 1963. I've got some lovely photos of that, which I'll put on the website. So, I hope you're building up a picture of medieval Bordeaux with its port and its trade, its huge churches and its importance on the pilgrim's route. And just to finish, I thought we must have a little section on surely the most important and best-known character from the area of the whole medieval era, and that is Eleanor of Aquitaine. 
There's not all that much to actually see Stroke visit in Bordeaux, really just the chapel at Saint-André where she was married, which I mentioned in a previous episode, and at the Musée d'Aquitaine, the most beautiful model of the statue of her from her tomb. The original is at Fontevraud Abbey in the Loire Valley, where she's buried, but the model of it here is beautiful. She lies full length, holding a book, looking very peaceful. She doesn't look over 80, which she was when she died. And there is just something very serene and beautiful about the model. Actually, you're not really seeing what you would have seen in the medieval period when it was made, because it's cream-coloured all over. And the original was brightly decorated. Small traces of paint on the original version show that she was wearing a blue and white dress and that she was laid to rest on a bright red sheet. Velvet, perhaps? I don't know. Anyway, Eleanor, Duchess of Aquitaine, was born in about 1122 as the daughter and eventually the heiress of William X, Duke of Aquitaine. All his lands, which were in fact larger than the lands held by the French king at the time, passed to her on her father's death, so she was hugely important in her own right, even before the date in 1137, when, at the age of only 15, she married the heir to the French throne, the future Louis the Seventh, who in fact became king very, very soon after their wedding. So she ruled as queen, or rather queen consort of France, for 15 years. Quite a tumultuous marriage, I think. She was known to be very beautiful, but also rather strong-willed, Louis is said to have adored her. I think maybe she was less enamoured, apparently having said of him at one point that il a l'air d'un moine. He reminds me of a monk. Evidence of her strong personality was there right from the start. She's said to have exerted considerable influence over him. She went on crusades with him. But eventually, at her instigation, the marriage was annulled. And just two months later, she married Henry Plantagenet. This time not at Bordeaux, but at Poitiers. But this time again, no sooner had she married him than he became the King of England. So it is because of her that England and Normandy, which Henry was Duke of, and Aquitaine, all became united under the same rule. They had eight children, many of whom went on to become kings and queens all over Europe. In fact, I've seen her described as the grandmother of Europe. So they would include Richard, who became Richard the Lionheart, and John, also King of England, Geoffrey, who was Duke of Brittany, and three daughters, Matilda, married the Duke of Saxony and Bavaria, Eleanor, married the King of Castile, and Joan, married not only William II, King of Sicily, but then subsequently Raymond VI, Count of Toulouse. I think Eleanor did finally meet her match in Henry. They were both hugely strong personalities, led a pretty turbulent life together, culminating, for example, in a moment when she joined her sons in revolt against her husband, for which he imprisoned her. That lasted for eleven years, but after his death, back she came, powerful as ever. For example, ruling England as regent during the periods when her son Richard was away on crusade. She had influence in many other ways too. Her court at Poitiers was a centre of music and poetry, somewhere that troubadours would visit a place where chivalry and manners were important, where books were read, religious paintings made, architecture encouraged. But primarily, I think her importance has to be political. Here's a good summary from an article on Eleanor of Aquitaine by the American author Mary Winston Nicklin. Quote, In an age when women were pawns in geopolitical alliances, Eleanor was recognised for her authority, diplomacy and political sagacity crisscrossing and administering her domains, affixing her signature to more than a hundred charters, ruling England as regent when her favourite son, Richard the Lionheart, was absent on crusade. She was a legend in ballads, even in her own time. And just to finish then, here are one or two extracts from a book on Eleanor of Aquitaine written by Alison Weir, describing Eleanor's first wedding, which took place in Saint-André in Bordeaux, and which very much give a flavour of the times. You might remember from a previous episode that over a thousand guests came to the Saint-André Cathedral, and here is what happened directly after the wedding ceremony conducted by the Bishop of Bordeaux was over. Quote, after the marriage service was concluded, the young couple sat enthroned on a dais in the chancel of the cathedral, 
both wearing the gold and ducal coronets of Aquitaine, which they had received from the archbishop, and they acknowledged the acclaim of their subjects. Then they proceeded through cheering crowds along a street strewn with leaves and past houses hung with tapestries, banners and greenery, to the sound of pipe and tabor and wooden sabots stamping in time to the music. Finally they arrived at the Ombriere Palace for the wedding banquet. They left Bordeaux immediately afterwards for Poitiers. In Poitiers then there were several more days of feasting, there was a glittering ceremony at Poitiers Cathedral, followed by a splendid banquet in the great hall of the Ducal Palace, and then this, quote, And so Eleanor rode to a new life in Paris. On the way, the royal cavalcade was intercepted by a messenger with heart-stopping news. Louis the Sixth had died of dysentery on the 1st of August, and young Louis and his wife were now king and queen of France. So then, that about wraps things up for this episode. You will certainly find, as you wander in Bordeaux, many layers of architecture representing all the different periods in which the city has been important. And two of the most colourful are those we've dealt with today, Roman times and the medieval period. Before closing, can I just remind you to go and have a look at the website, if you haven't already, because on there there will be a blog post to accompany this episode and lots of photos of many of the things I've discussed. Plus, of course, links to all the places mentioned to make it easy for you to find them should you decide to visit them yourself. As for City Breaks Bordeaux, the next episode, number four, will focus on Bordeaux as a maritime and trading city, giving a little background history and visiting several places in the city today which you can visit to find out about the success and more success of Bordeaux's role as a port and also the darker side, the connections that brought to the slave trade. I hope very much that you will be able to join me for that. And meanwhile, thank you very much for listening and goodbye. Or, as the French might put it, merci bien et au revoir.